Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as, as pre presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a fabulous one on the Book of Romans. It's the series on, on the, uh, from October through December of 2017. And this is lesson number four in that series entitled Justified by Faith. It's the lesson for October 28th of 2017, and it mainly focuses on the first little bit and the last part of Romans 3. So, that's, if you get your Bible, get it out, we'll be ready to tackle that challenge. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we read these very, very significant words, help us to understand them to place them in the right context, to realize the very much larger great controversy than what most people recognize as we consider your way of saving us. And may that change which needs to take place in us take place in us now as we prepare for your soon coming is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me begin by reading the introductory section from our Bible study guide. In this lesson, we come to the basic theme of Romans, justification by faith. The great truth that, more than any other, brought about the Protestant Reformation. And despite all the claims to the contrary, Rome has not much changed, I'm sorry, has no more changed regarding this belief now than it did in 1520, when Pope Leo issued a papal bull condemning Luther and his teachings. Luther burned a copy of the bull because if there were one teaching that could never be compromised, justification by faith was and is it. The phrase itself is a figure based on law. The transgressor of the law comes before a judge and is condemned to death for his transgressions. Now, when, if someone's condemned to death for their transgressions, is that a civil disobedience or is that a criminal act? Criminal, criminal. That's criminal, okay. But a substitute appears and takes the transgressor's crimes upon himself, thus clearing the criminal. Now, if someone had committed murder in one of our courts here, and someone else rushed in, say a brother or a cousin or someone said, oh man, I love this man, I know he killed somebody, but I'll, I'll let me die in his place, would we be happy to have the, the, the murderer released? It's insane. Okay. By accepting the substitute, the, crime, the criminal now stands before the judge not only cleared of his guilt, but also regarded as never having committed the crimes for which he was first brought into court. And that's because the substitute, who has a perfect record, offers the pardoned criminal his own perfect law-keeping. In the plan of salvation, each of us is the criminal. The substitute, Jesus, has a perfect record and he stands in the court in our stead his righteousness accepted in place of our unrighteousness. Hence, we are justified before God, not because of our works, but because of Jesus, whose righteousness becomes ours when we accept it by faith. Talk about good news. In fact, the news can't get any better than that. Well, that's enough to make you ill. <laughs> well, these paragraphs raise a great number of questions. Does it seem unreal? Can sins actually be transferred or moved around? Ezekiel seemed to suggest that they can't. Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 33, verses 20 to 20, 12 to 20. Will heaven be filled with hardened but pardoned criminals for whom a substitute has been found? No way. Would you want to live in heaven as a Christian or a Jew between a Stalin and a Hitler if they were only pardoned? What would you say about a human judge who did that? Wouldn't the judge go to jail? And God, are God the Father and the angels deceived by that legal exchange? So if by this process sins can be blotted out, and you know the verse in, in Micah 7, verse 9, let me see if I can... 19. I'm sorry, 19. You will be, you will be merciful to us once again, talking about God, you will trample our sins underfoot and send them to the bottom of the sea. So how does that work? 
how do your sins get sent to the bottom of the sea? You're not going to bring them up again. Not gonna... Well, okay, fair enough. Then what about David's sin? We, st we read about his sins all the time. Right. And all the rest of the saints in the Bible. Which saints in the Bible don't have any sins recorded against them? Only a very few. I guess maybe Joseph and Daniel. Yeah. Or is God... Go ahead. Enoch. Denary. Enoch, yeah. Or is God the, the father, God the Father, the judge, the only one who does not know about them? So what is faith? Based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Faith is just a word we use to denote a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. So let's, let's nail that down right now. Faith is what? It's a description, it's a word to describe a relationship with God. Faith is a word describing a relationship with God. And well, the, uh, synonyms would be trust, trust belief, confidence, confidence yeah. persuasion. Mm -hmm. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deep admiration. It means having enough confidence in Him, that's another word for trust or faith, based on the more than adequate evidence revealed, do we think enough, enough evidence is available, to be willing to believe whatever He says as soon as we are sure He is the one saying it, to accept whatever He offers as soon as we are sure He is the one offering it, and to do whatever he wishes us, he wishes, as soon as we are sure he's the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, they're described that way in the Bible, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. You can find that in a great book called You Can Trust the Bible uh, with some additions there. So, let's review again. The word justified or justification is a Latin term brought into English, but it is a translation from the Greek word dikaiao, which means to be put right or set right. When a tree is petrified, notice the F-I-E-D at the end of the word, is it just declared stone? Or has it really become stone? Well, go to the petrified forest if you want and check it out for yourself. Is the idea of substitution in the plan of salvation a legal fiction? In criminal law, there's no way to substitute anything. No righteous person can die on behalf of a criminal and let, it, let the criminal go free. That's a perversion of justice. Our law would never permit it. By contrast, in a civil law, now let's notice this. In civil law, we allow substitution all the time. If you have a motor vehicle accident, which is not intentional, and yet you damage another person's property, your insurance company can serve as your substitute and pay for the damages. But such a maneuver is never allowed in criminal law. So, if we say that this is to be allowed regarding sin, aren't we actually trivializing sin, suggesting that is nothing more than a civil offense that we did not intend to do rather than a crime. Well, it seems to be the modern idea that uh, people are basically good mm -hmm. and that they just make some wrong choices. So, you know, they, they, they can be redeemed by better information or something and then they're, they can just go on. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans three nineteen and 20. For we, now, for we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law in order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. For no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law re does is to make people know that they have sinned. What's the purpose of the law? To show us sin. Make people understand that they're sinners. And you can read Hebrews 10, 3 and 4, Galatians 3, 19 to 24. There's other places where it says basically the same thing. These verses suggest that the purpose of the law and the sacrifice was to remind us of sin. 
Paul pointed out elsewhere that if we could truly keep the law, we could be saved by doing so. And there's, there's lots of verses like that in the Old Testament. Look at Romans 2.13 in the New Testament. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law commands. So we, and there's a whole bunch of verses that basically say the same thing. So the problem is not with the law, but with our ability to keep it. If we do not know what is wrong, we need law. What was Paul referring to when he talked about law in these verses? What was Paul's background? The Pharisee. He was so a he Pharisee. Looked at the, the books of Moses and really the entire scripture, as you pointed yeah. out. So he looked at the Old Testament, which was available in his day. He looked at the five books of Moses, and the Jews called that the Torah, which means law. Then there's another set of books in the middle of the Old Testament, and some toward the further down, that they called the prophets. And then they had a third category called the hagiography or the, the Psalms is sometimes called the Psalms because the Psalms is the first book in that category. The Holy Writings it's sometimes called. So there's those three sections and in a Hebrew Bible those are the three sections. If you get a modern Hebrew Bible it'll probably call, be called the Tanakh and that's an acronym for Torah and Ketuvim and, and Neboim. Uh, so, scholars recognize that to a Pharisee, as Paul was, law would mean, at a minimum, the five books of Moses. And often the term was used to describe the entire scripture at that time, the whole Old Testament. How do we know that? Look, for example, at John 10, 34. Jesus himself talking. Jesus answered, it, was, it is written in your own law that God said, <coughs> you are God's. Where does that come from? Psalm 82.6, you are gods, I said. All of you are children of the Most High. So Jesus himself called Psalm, something from the Psalms, in the third section of the Old Testament, <coughs> he, he called it the law. So all the law can do is to point out our sins and hopefully thereby lead us to Christ as the only possible solution. <laughs> so does that, does that solution happen by a substitution or how does it happen? Well, our Bible study guide suggests that justification makes us righteous before God. If that is actually true, why couldn't God just arrange for everyone to be justified just before she or he dies so that everyone could be saved? Because it comes down to a choice. <clears throat> oh, but yeah. that sounds like a choice. It sounds like something that happens in us. Right. It, it comes down to the will. Mm-hmm. Do we choose to do God's will or do we do, choose to do our own? As C.S. Lewis says at the end of The Great Divorce, there's only two kinds of people. In the end, there's those who say to God, thy, uh, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. So uh, it's, it really comes down to the will. Yeah. Okay. And if, if God can somehow <coughs> change our salvation, by adjusting some book somewhere, why didn't he do that to Satan when sin first started? And just avoid this whole mess? Because God is love. And without choice, there is no love. Well, here's a statement from our Bible study guide. We just read it. The substitute, Jesus, has a perfect record. And he stands in the court in our stead. His righteousness accepted in the place of our unrighteousness. Hence, we are justified before God, not because of our works, but because of Jesus, whose righteousness becomes ours when we accept it by faith. Now, how do we accept it by faith? Does someone have, who has faith, are they really different than someone who doesn't have faith? Well, in terms of the relationship, yes, because if you don't have faith in the person, you're going to turn and go somewhere else. Each of us has turned to our own ways instead of uh, following after the Lord. So remember, Martin Luther wanted to make it very clear that our works has nothing, because he had that background of the Catholics on the, the good works versus the bad works, he wanted to make it absolutely certain that 
Nothing, nothing, nothing that we can do has anything to do with our salvation. Well, so then you, you're left, you know, if you if you get into the tulip way of thinking mm -hmm. of Calvin, then if you, you can't even choose. Yeah. You're so depraved that you can't even choose. And then God, of course, then God has to do the choosing and he picks out certain ones. So, mm -hmm. uh, and of course we reject that. We uh, believe that we we do have free will. respond to his grace. We respond to the light or we turn from the light. Uh, it's a choice that we make. So the question then is, are we really changed or not? Yeah, a choice. It's a boils well, down to a if, choice. If God, if God says we're justified, let's just say for a moment now, God has declared us justified. When he says that, does that make it so? Or does he say it because it is so? so? Are we going in the right direction, the correct mm -hmm. Have we turned around? Have we repented? Instead of going this way, we're going this way. Conversion means to turn around. Right. Yeah. In, Repentance means in it. In creation, of course, when he's, he speaks and it, it's so, he commands and stands fast. So if he's creating something, the first line does hold up. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's both, really. He's creating a new life in us. Uh, you could put it in, that, in those terms. The way but God deals with sin, it's not by contract. And it's not penal; it's purely a, a, a healing process. And the way, uh, as if we <laughs> have the wrong concept of God, we're not going to take lis uh, listen to Him, and, and we're not going to be benefit. We're going to get over to the Romans eight verse three eventually, and we're going to say, "He, God, dealt with sin by sending a Son to do away with sin." How does the Son do away with sin? Well, for many years there's been a huge debate among theologians about the precise role of justification versus sanctification. How many discussions have we heard about that? Evangelical scholars would say that when we are justified, God counts us as righteous or even perhaps declares us righteous with any, without any change whatsoever in us. They come to this conclusion because they want to make it very clear that none of our works can contribute in any way to our salvation. It's very interesting that if you read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, let's turn there for just a moment. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. What does the filthy clothes represent? Sin. His own his righteousness. His sins. Yeah, or his own righteousness, I, which I is, righteousness. yeah. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. What's the first step? Take away the filthy clothes the man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. That's a real change. And we'll see this again in uh, in chapter six. Oh yeah, the death, burial, <clears throat> and resurrection. We we die with Christ, but we are then raised to newness of life. Ellen White comments about that with these words: None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts, there will be no song sung. To me that love myself and wash myself, redeem myself, unto <laughs> me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. It it's almost seems sacrilegious to, to, to say that. Um, but this is the keynote of the song that is sung by many here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not mean to know what this know this if they could avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ, his meekness and lowliness. So how do we learn about Christ? By submitting, the gospels. <clears throat> submitting to him and, mm -hmm. and coming to know him. Reading the gospels, look, studying his life, thinking about what happens, listening to what, hap what he wants to do with our lives and so forth. So that's what's going on. 
That's what needs to happen. So what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is, is not in his power to do for himself. Now, our forensic friends would love to stop right there, but it, the quotation doesn't stop there. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That part's okay. When they begin to praise and exalt God all the day long, then by beholding, they are becoming changed into the same image. I thought we, would, we didn't need to be changed. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. These lessons you have never learned, he's, she was writing to a pastor, a former pastor, oh, that you could realize the value of the human soul, written from October 12, 1896, from Adelaide, Australia. Well, righteousness or justice is obedience to the law. The law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law, but is incapable of rendering it. The only way in which he can attain to the righteousness is through faith. By faith he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the obedience of his Son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure, and God receives, receives pardon, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his, sin, his Son. Now, those are very powerful words. What, what do they say to us? He treats us as though we are righteous. What does that say? We have access to him. Uh, if No man can see God and live. Mm -hmm. So that presents a, demo, a dilemma for the loving God to get mm -hmm. close to his people. And so we have the sanctuary, you know, God getting as close as he can. But there's still all this stuff between uh, the Shekinah glory and the people out there. If there weren't, we would perish. Right, we would perish. So how is he going to change us? Well, Jesus comes, he, die, uh, he lives the life, he, uh, he dies, he, he's raised, uh, and we are, die and are raised with him. So by beholding him, we, it, it's almost like we're, he's a step-down transformer mm -hmm. in a way. We, we don't see the fullness of God's uh, glory, but we see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, and then we are changed from one degree of glory to the next. So that in, in, if we could just carry that thought on, there could become a, a time where the mediator, Christ, could, if we are able to see the light of the full light of God's glory, we could abide in the, the light of a holy God without a mediator for, for a period of time. I'm not mm -hmm. going to define that much further, but you've heard that mocked, of course, mm -hmm. that statement she makes. Well, is Christ righteous? So if we become like him, what kind of people will populate heaven? Once again, in order to correctly compare these two quotations of what we have read, we need to recognize that justice and righteousness are translated from the same word in the original Greek manuscripts of the Bible. Notice these words from the Bible Study Guide for October 23 of 2017. The faith of Jesus Christ is here, doubtless, faith in Jesus Christ. These are words from Martin Luther. As it operates in the Christian life, faith is much more than intellectual assent. It is more than just an acknowledgement of certain facts about Christ's life and his death. Instead, true faith in Jesus Christ is accepting him as Savior, Substitute, Surety, and Lord. It is choosing his way of life. It is trusting him and seeking by faith to live according to his commandments. Is that more than justification? It looks to me like it's a matter of developing the character of uh, like Jesus like God. Uh, if we say the Ten Commandments is a transcript of God's character, yeah. and they talk about that His glory is also His character, uh, then what we have a problem is to develop our character. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what our Bible study guide once more says. The true heart of the discovery 
of both the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther was genuine clarity on how the demands of God's justice could be satisfied without doing away with his law. Okay, let's see what we can figure out here. Key for them was the fact that Christ met the demands of divine justice. Who, who is making those demands, by the way? Um, this well, is that implies that God arbitrarily set up some uh, system, but it's right this, doing. Is this can, this says the demands of divine justice for us in His life of active, perfect obedience to the law and His passive substitutionary death for sinners? So that clearly suggests that it's God the Father who's making the demands, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you read this passage, that's what it says. Thus, as a sin bearer, Christ satisfied the just demands of God's law, which demands eternal death. So what's the just demands of God's law? Eternal death, Romans 6.23, as payment for the wages of sin. And through Christ's payment of the debt in his holy life, God has made full provision for the forgiveness of human sin. Is this legal fiction? Well, think about it. Surely we do not believe that Jesus would actually spend the rest of eternity in jail or dead or in the fires of hell. So what, what do people traditionally teach is the result of being a sinner? Burning in hell, but of course it's taken from the, 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 the correct idea of being the second death, mm -hmm. the lake of fire. But <clears throat> not just people are thrown in there, there's death and, and Hades are thrown in there, and the beast and the false prophet are thrown in there. So it's not just some material burning that's being talked about there, it's talking about the destruction of everything that is hateful and against God and his government. Well, but if we're really saying that Jesus is our substitute, that means he's taken our place, right? And our rightful place, according to many who believe the forensic approach to salvation, our rightful place is in the fires of hell. So if Jesus is our substitute, he should be in the fires of hell, right? Does, uh, when Jesus came here, did he give up anything? Well, he gave up his omnipresent. Well, during the three years he was here, or the 30th, three years he was here. So when he went back to heaven, did he get everything back that he was no. before? The Bible seems to suggest that he's going to retain human, human, uh, human form, meaning he gave up his omnipresence. So in some sense we could say he, uh, he, he that something was changed or destroyed willingly in order to redeem us. Now I'm not trying to buy into the substitution that they're they're talking about but there mm -hmm. I, I think maybe where that's where some of the idea might come from is that mm -hmm. he did give it, it wasn't just that he spent three nights in the grave and then he goes back to heaven and and that's it you know he uh, mm -hmm. he gave up things in order to to save us so uh, you could almost say those things were destroyed forever, uh, just as the, the other things. Um, but um, that's just, you know, human reasoning. It's not necessarily the okay. way it is. Well, if God can forgive him, Christ, who's taken on us our sins according to this model, so that he does not in fact experience that punishment, why doesn't God just forgive us to begin with if that's all that's needed? He has. Yeah. Everybody's forgiven. Hitler and Idi Amin. And so what is actually accomplished by this substitution? It's made up. What happens to our sins when we confess them? If we are justified, do our sins disappear permanently? Well, I think in the, in the sanctuary model, they were covered until the Day of Atonement, and then they're, they're blotted out. So uh, if we were to follow that, they're covered right okay. now. 
or covered is kind of like quarantine and get get them out of the camp. It's, it, sin there again was approached as a disease or dealt with as a disease. Because yeah. if we took away all the our sins from the, you know, of course we we still w might continue to sin, but uh, if all the evidence was taken away, then there wouldn't be anything to, to convict us. So if we turned away from God, if it were only about forensic uh, mm -hmm. uh, forgiveness or, or such, then uh, we would be, uh, it's like, well, I'm forgiven, so uh, well, I but can do you, whatever I want. Yeah, see, if you think that God is angry against sin and we're sinners, then what you need most of all is his forgiveness. So if you're back in the good graces of God, then you can be saved, right? Well, the, but it depends on what you mean by saved. If you're thinking of saved as going to heaven someday, uh, That's what most people think. I know, but heaven begins when we receive the Holy Spirit. So really, salvation begins the moment that you accept Jesus into your heart. So, and we have done nothing to, uh, to bring that about. Uh, eventually, the, the body is going to be redeemed also when it's changed from this mortal estate into mm -hmm. immortality. And there's nothing we can do about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can grow in his grace. We can uh, put away those things that uh, weaken our faith and seek after all those things that grow our faith. And we might call that sanctification because it's a process okay. of getting to know him and trust him more and more until we have, uh, we settle into the truth as <laughs> Ellen White says. Yeah. How do you understand Isaiah? Um, Isaiah 44, 22, my Bible says, I have swept away your sins like a cloud. Come back to me, I'm the one who saves you. Can God do that? Well, he can deal with us as if they weren't uh, an issue. Uh, okay. You know, if you have, if you've sinned against somebody and they said they forgive you, but every time you try to deal with them, they keep holding this, you know, you owe me because you, <laughs> you yeah. did this. Or do you remember, I can't trust you because you did this, you know. It's we don't have time to read all these verses, but Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were forgiven. Psalms 51, David's forg confession. Proverbs 28, 13, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Uh, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Hebrews 9, 5, Exodus 25, 18 to 21. In these verses, we learn that Adam and Eve's attempts to cover their sins were futile. The book of Proverbs warns us against trying to conceal our sins. Proverbs indicates that, rather, we need to confess and forsake them. Forsaking, what does that mean? You stop doing them, right? Mm -hmm. Romans and Hebrews suggest that like the ancient Jews at the sanctuary, we need to take our sins to a place called the Helisterion, or the mercy seat in the most holy place. Helisterion is the, is the Greek word. Where they're blotted out and vanished from God's sight. They're carried off by the uh, scapegoat, as you remember. Do they, does God truly, uh, do they, our sins, do they tr truly disappear for good? Does God, the omniscient one, forget? Just doesn't mm. bring them up again. Okay. Well, but it says in a half a dozen places, at least in the Bible, yeah. that they come up again in the judgment, don't they? Yeah, but this is, uh, you know, on the, when you put it, when he puts them on the s scapegoat, the judgment is over already. Mm -hmm, yeah. So that's, that's a future date. It's not right now. Right now they're covered. Okay, we've got a few verses to work our way through that are very significant. Look at first Romans 3, 24. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Christ Jesus, who sets them free. Free gift of his grace, all are put right with him through Christ Jesus, who sets them free. Okay? What is happening in this verse? Are we literally made righteous, the original meaning of justify, or are we only declared righteous or considered righteous? Do we become acceptable to God? What would that mean? Okay, and our Bible study guide says again, justification is presented in Romans as a punctiliar act. What does that mean? Point in time. It happens at a point in time. One moment the sinner is outside, unrighteous and unaccepted. 
the next moment following justification, the person is inside, accepted, and righteous. Is that, isn't that a change? Yes. That's what, you know, when you're born again, you, new things have come. Uh, okay. So, can God just do that to anybody? Not without their choice. Okay, so we have the choice thing again. Of course, we all recognize that this process is not permanent. Despite the belief of some in a once saved, always saved kind of salvation, the truth is that we return to our sins. Then we must do it all over again. What happens if we have sinned and die before we're justified? Well, it's the, uh, Ellen White says it's the general trend of the life, not the okay. occasional deed or misdeed. So if, as long as that connection with God remains, we are in, uh, we, uh, are in a saving relationship. But uh, okay. if we neglect our relationship with him, that can weaken just like any other ratio. So if we don't have time, I'm sorry, if we don't have time to read the Bible, pray, and witness, what happens with the relationship? It weakens and eventually it can die or we can uh, kill it by turning and choosing our own way instead. I believe there's a very serious flaw in this whole approach to salvation. People are encouraged to focus on their past sins in order to have them forgiven. Focusing on sin is the last thing we should be doing. It is a law, now I'm quoting Ellen White, it is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. So what happens if we're looking at sin? We want more of it. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. Big Controversy 555. What happens to us if we're always focusing on our past sins in order to make sure that they get forgiven? The only safe path is for us to focus on Jesus, his life and his death, and constantly consider the implications of that most important event in history. Look at Romans 3, 25 and 26 now. I'll read from my Good News Bible first. God offered him so that by his blood, that's his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to, so now what is God trying to accomplish? To demonstrate that he is righteous. One time. In the past he, is pa he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But in the present time he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And this way God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. And the purpose of demonstration is education, mm -hmm. is teaching. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, everything I learned from my Father I've made known unto you. Yeah. The Father loves you himself. You know. So if you don't have a great controversy, why does God need to say three times that the purpose of the death of Jesus is to demonstrate God's righteousness, to demonstrate God's righteousness, to demonstrate God's righteousness. And oh, oh yes, by the way, he will make us righteous as well. And Romans 1, 17, mm -hmm. for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. A mm -hmm. revealing is there again, a demonstration, yeah. it's a teaching process. Well, going back to the King James, for those of you who like the King James, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, there it is the first time, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, remember justice the same as in, in the Greek, same as righteousness, and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. So once again, even if you read in the old translations, three times God has to say, I need to, I need to demonstrate my righteousness before I can do anything about your sins. But you go back up to 325 where he says a propitiation, which is yeah. not in the Greek. It's just no. a, it's a, it's a problem of the theological spectacles on the part of the translators that they yeah. came up with that mumbo jumbo. Yeah. And what does propitiation mean? Appeasement. Yeah. It means someone's angry at you and so you do something to try to appease their wrath. But God is love. Yeah. And God, for God so loved the world that he 
gave over his son or delivered his son so that uh, for to teach people how to live. So many translations use the word propitiation, some use the word expiation, it's somewhat similar. Does God's wrath need to be appeased? No. Could it, can it be re removed by some mechanism? So we already read in Romans 1 what God's wrath is, didn't we? Well, he gives people over to their sin, so, uh, but he loves them and he, he wants them to be saved, so mm -hmm. a way has to be found to draw them back. But so he can't, Jesus, Jesus he can't. is lifted up so that he might draw all to him. He can't force you to, to make mm -hmm. a decision. Mm -hmm. So what do these things have to do with the mercy seat, the <laughs> golden lid on the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary? And what was Paul suggesting when he said that because of the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed? Now that's the New American Standard Version. Will God continue to pass over our sins even today? Well, in some sense, you know, if, if sin, if we if just even, just keeping us alive, you know, Ellen White says there's this atmosphere of grace that mm -hmm. surrounds the earth as real as the air we mm -hmm. breathe. So there is, there is a sense in which he, he passes over them for the moment because we're not consumed. But, uh, but there will come a time when grace ceases to plead. Can, okay. Can we par be, become partakers of God's righteousness? Well, that's the whole point. Uh, we have no righteousness of our own, and so by beholding him, we're transformed from one degree of glory to the next. In other words, we are reflected. We're reflecting his character. Who does that for us? Well, Jesus uh, becomes the mediator of that yeah. so that we can It's the holy, holy Spirit who actually acts in our life. It suggests right. in several places. There's a sequence, the Father, yeah. the Son, the Holy Spirit. So is that now a legal exchange, or an instantaneous change? If God's righteousness is instantly placed to our account, what happens to that righteousness the next time we sin? Well, that you're again talking in legal terms. Yeah. Uh, but that's not how a relationship works. Okay. So because of the cross of Calvary, this is our Bible study guide, because of the cross of Calvary, God can declare sinners righteous and still be considered just and fair in the eyes of the universe. Now, how does that happen? What does his accepting, if we want to put, use that term, the death of Christ on the cross, how does that make it possible for him to still believe in the law, which is a transcript of his character. Well, it says the study guide, so mm -hmm. it's not the Bible. No. It's not the words of Ellen White, so no. maybe we just well, up and skip over that. Only, only in the sense that we are in Christ, to the extent that we are in Christ, uh, we are in what he's done. But the, it, again, it's looking at it from a different perspective. If the Holy Spirit actually comes and applies somehow the righteousness of Christ to us, if we're changed by beholding, by reading the Bible, by listening and talking about him and all those kinds of things, does that change our behavior over the next 24 hours? Yes. So faith can change us. Faith well, our, right. faith, our faith holds on to the promises and, and, uh, and God has provided everything uh, as Peter, I believe, says, pertaining to life and godliness, mm -hmm. uh, these precious promises. So he provides, he's at work in us. Should my boss at work uh, be able to see that in me? Yes. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That'll happen in 24 hours? I'm, that's the questions I'm asking. <laughs> they should see a change in us. It's not going to, obviously it's not going to be a finished product in 24 hours, that's for sure. 
So if all this is true, do we still need to obey the law? Can we even obey the law? That's the only way we can obey the law is by, as, as Martin Luther pointed out at the, in the quotation, I think at the beginning of this lesson or the other one, <laughs> about uh, they do the works uh, by the letter but not by the Spirit. Yeah. So once we are filled with the Spirit, then we can do the works uh, according to the Spirit. We yeah. can walk after the Spirit and we will um, do those things that pertain to the law. So Paul, Paul follows up with Romans 3.28, For we conclude that a person is put right with God only through faith, and not by doing what the law commands. Okay? Starts so, with faith. Yeah. Then you do. Well, so when we have that relationship with mm -hmm. God, we will, if we really understand, we really like what we see, we will be changed to become like him. Elsewhere in Paul's writings, as well as in the statements from Jesus, James, and John, we are told clearly that God's true people will keep the commandments. Look at Matthew 19, 17. Well, just to look at a couple of those verses. Look at Matthew 19, 17, Jesus' own words. Why do you ask me anything concerning what is good? Answered Jesus. There's only one who is good. Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. Romans 2, 13. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law demands. James 2, 10 and 11. Whoever breaks, one of, whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all, for the same one who says do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. It's pretty clear what law he's talking about. And Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12 suggests that God's final faithful group of people at the end will be commandment keepers. So how does that relate to justification and salvation? <coughs> well, here's another point. Substitution is another long Latin term. Key for them, that is for Paul and Martin Luther, according to our Bible study guide, was the fact that Christ met the demands of divine justice for us in his life of active, perfect obedience to the law and in his passive, substitutionary death for sinners. We looked at those words earlier. Thus, as the sin-bearer, Christ satisfied the just demands of God's law, which demands eternal death, Romans 6.23, as payment for the wages of sin. Okay, we're, we're going to go back over that. And through Christ's payment of the debt in his holy life, God has made full provision for the forgiveness of human sin. So now that Jesus has paid the debt, God can forgive sins. Is that the way it works? Does, does someone have to die before God can forgive sins? No. Anyone? As Jim pointed out, you know, Jesus said 70 times 7. So if he asked that of uh, mortal sinful people, surely God could do that, forgive people also. So, um, so it's, there's more to it. It's not just about forgiveness. Certainly yeah. that it, forgiveness needs to be done, but it's, it's not like uh, you got to wring it out of his heart. Enoch and Elijah went to heaven without dying. Yeah. And uh, that was before Jesus died. Yeah. So uh, Moses did too. Yeah. Well, he died. He, well, he died first. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Enoch and Elijah. So uh, the the paradigm is is tweaked to come up with so many of these quotes that they've they've mm -hmm. conjured up. <clears throat> so once again, let's re review here. I want you to think about this. If the consequences of sin are eternal death, do we do we believe that? Well, if, the first death is described as a sleep, but also uh, when, when we, when we, well, the baptism is a, like a type, supposedly like a death, where we mm -hmm. die to self. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and of course, Romans 6.23 doesn't say oh. wages of sin is eternal death. It just says it's death. Death weighs its wage, death. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it, what it, is that? What is that wage? Well, it's not God doing it. No. So, uh, so if Jesus Christ is our substitute, if 
if he's going to take our place, then whatever sin was supposed to do to us, it should have done to him. Well, if in that paradigm, in that way, look at things. But uh, I look at God as a teacher and not a penalty payer. And God does everything he possibly can to get intelligent, his intelligent creatures from way back to live in harmony and not be self-centered. And uh, that's a teaching process that's going to go on for eternity. But yet we get to a point where we say, well, 2,000 years ago, we've learned that Jesus could be trusted, that Jesus' judgment can be trusted. And the whole universe, the beads in the heavenly places, says that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. They subscribe to it. Yeah. And hopefully we do it, those of us that uh, admire so the way God. So Jesus was dead for a little less than three days. <clears throat> Does that pay the debt for all sinners? It's not a contract problem. It's not a penalty, pro penal problem. It's, uh, a, it's a disease problem that needs healing. Yeah. Well, and, and, and so if, if we're just that, nothing but penalty or nothing but legal problem, couldn't sinners each be allowed to die for three days and that, that, or less and pay for their own debt? So that Jesus would not have to die, have to do so. That would be a kind of purgatory, right? Yeah, that's what yeah. there's a big church that subscribes that idea. The second death, so. Well, or did he just die? Of here, here would death? be the question. Back at the beginning, Satan says you can sin and you won't die. I mean, God says if you sin, you will die first. Right. Then Satan says, no, you can sin and you won't die. Has that question been answered? Well, it depends who it's been answered for because an awful lot of the people that have been living down through the centuries and are still alive don't believe that. They believe that, that you die. This death, whatever it is, it ends up a torture chamber for whatever length. Or maybe it's a purging process called purgatory and maybe ultimately you have universal salvation. Uh, so it's, it's all a big spectrum of... Well, but, but I'm saying in the great controversy, we say oh, these questions need to be answered. That's true. That's and in the great controversy, they're answered by the fact that God says, do you want to see what happens when a person is left to the consequences of sin? Not his sin, but sin in general. And the answer is Jesus died. That, which was really collateral damage, wasn't right. it? It wasn't, uh, Jesus didn't sin. Why would it be necessary through Christ's death for God first to demonstrate that he himself is righteous before he could put right those who trust in Jesus? Has anyone ever questioned God's righteousness? We've asked this question many times. Or his truthfulness? And doesn't the righteousness of God himself, his own personal righteousness of character, and even the way he runs his government, need to be revealed? If you understand that Satan's making all these accusations, yes. I think in the book Education, something like Ellen White says, redemption in, ed in education, or something to that effect, it's, uh, they're, they're really synonymous. In Romans 1, 18 to 32, we learn that the pagan people of Rome were very sinful. Then in Romans 2, we were surprised to see that in God's eyes, the critical judgmental Jews were even worse. Then in Romans 3, Paul tried to draw some conclusions. Even if every person who has ever lived is a sinner, that does not make God a sinner. Romans 3, 9 and 10. God can and does save sinners. And he can do so in such a way as to convince the entire universe, the court in heaven, that it is safe to do so. But first he must convince all of us that he is right in everything that he has said so far. So quoting Psalms 51 verse 4, Paul spoke about God Romans 3, 4, you must show to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. The original questions in the great controversy were about God. Humans had not even been created yet when that controversy started. Revelation 12, 7 to 12, you know the verses there. If God is a liar, as Satan claims in Genesis 3, 1 to 4, then no one is left who can be trusted. But by the life, death, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, all of Satan's accusations have been refuted, and all of his questions have been completely and adequately answered. The questions were not about us. We're all sinners. Everyone knows that we are sinners. It has been <coughs> fully and adequately shown that God has not lied to us. Everyone, 
uh, I'm sorry, everything he said about sin and its consequences is true. It's not God that we need to be afraid of, it is sin. Sin kills sinners. It is not God that kills sinners. Or is God demanding his pound of flesh? Learning the truth about God is what sets us right, no, not some legal transaction. And here's a very interesting quotation from Ellen White that has not been quoted very often, almost never, basically, but is really powerful in my opinion. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. <coughs> the only way, notice that, the only way in which he could set and keep men right, what does it mean to set men right? What's another word for that? A long Latin word? Justification, right? And keep men right, what's a long Latin word for that? Sanctification. Sanctification. So the only way to be justified and sanctified was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. That men might have salvation, there's another long Latin word, he came directly to man and became a partaker of his nature. And then she concludes with these words, Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. Now up above we read, it was there, there's only one way to do it, revealing God. Now he says, the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. How does it happen? Revelation. Tell the truth about God. And Christ was arrayed before men, the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And he hadn't died yet. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, now she said that, what, three or four times already. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. In this larger view, great controversy, trust to model, the plan of salvation is first and foremost about God. Our kind and loving Father, show us your glory. Show us your character. Teach us about you. Teach us about Jesus. Help us to see him <clears throat> every day in all, act, all our activities and to represent him to all around us because this is what really happens to those who exercise faith. We believe that. We claim that promise today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.